All right, let's take a moment. We'll welcome anybody visiting with us this morning. Good to have uh, Pastor Smith and his wife here. They're, get this, they're from Summertown, Tennessee. Doesn't that sound good? And uh, I told them, boy, that summer just sounds great, you know. But unfortunately, they're here because they were in a car accident up in Mansfield. And um, they made it down here, and I think getting work done on the vehicle, I think. But thankfully, they're all okay. Families are. He's got four other children out in Children's Church. And um, it's a blessing the Lord had them uh, come our way. Some of you might remember Pastor Paul Shire. Uh, he was uh, visited up here. He knows Brother Moreland. Uh, do you know Brother Ron Moreland? Do you know him? Yeah, that's good. You're better off. If you know him. <laughs> and uh, he... Uh, Brother Shire called me and said he had a preacher friend in town, got kind of stranded here with uh, being in an accident. At first he told me, you know how those southern drivers are, they don't know how to drive up north. And he said, nah, the truth is an Ohio driver hit him. I said, well, that's true. So uh, it's, it's good to have you this morning, though, my friend. Glad you're here today. And then right behind him, this is Nathaniel. He's from Columbus here and uh, lives in the same building as Quentin. And uh, good to have you this morning, Nathaniel. Amen. Thank you for being in the service today. The usher will hand you a visitor's card if he hasn't already, and uh, we want you to fill that out for us. He's moving towards you right now, I'm sure. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. All right. You can give one to the preacher there, too, because it's got a free pen on it, man. Anything free you take, all right? So uh, fill that out. We'll have a record of your visit with us this morning. Uh, we're glad you're here today. Let's, anybody else this morning? Here for the first time, Mary Wharton's back, first time in a long time. It's good to see Mary here. Good to see Chris and Eric here this morning, too, from Brunswick, Ohio now, if I remember correctly, and uh, came down here just to get warm, probably, and uh, it uh, hasn't, hasn't hit spring up there yet, I don't think, and uh, still a lot of snow and such, so it's good to see you this morning. All right, let's give them all a warm welcome, shall we?
305 together. 305, praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. 305, let's sing all three verses together. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing all worth his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him. Highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins, he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unfounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him. Prophet and priest and king Coming over the world victorious Power and glory unto the Lord belong Praise him, praise him Tell of his excellent greatness Praise him, praise him Ever in joyful song Good singing this morning. Let's turn back to 228 together. 228. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. 228. He hideth my soul. Let's all stand together one more time as we sing. On that first together. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock Where rivers of pleasure I see He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock That shadows a dry thirsty land He hideth my life in the dead of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand a wonderful savior is Jesus my Lord he taketh my burden away he holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength at my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love. Amen. 
greet one another, make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. Together when clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. On that last, when clothed in his brightness, to meet him in clouds of the sky, his perfect salvation, his wonderful love, how shall Amen. Be seated, if you will. Ushers will come, and they'll get our offering now. By the way, a great three-on-three uh, -three tournament yesterday over at the Y for the teenagers, and had good participation, and um, had two young men accept Christ as their Savior yesterday. And so that was good, good, a good time, and I uh, appreciate all those who helped out with that. Tonight, uh, the teens will be having their nachos and cheese uh, and something to drink after the service tonight, so you have your church service and a snack all in one all right so uh that'll be after the service tonight so uh make a note of that if you would please all right let's pray and ask god's blessing on our offering today brother linke why don't you lead us in our prayer? let's pray lord we do thank you and praise you for such a beautiful day you've given us to worship you on god i pray you just help us to uh be mindful of the funds that go in that we can use it for your honor and glory and God, I pray that you just touch us in a special way today. Lord, I pray your will be done. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Take your Bible this morning, if you would please, for our scripture reading to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, please. We are going to read verses 1 through 9. Verses 1 through 9 of Mark chapter 14. And we'll read them responsively as we normally do. Begin together on verse 1, and then I'll read verse 2, and we'll alternate till we end together on verse number 9 of Mark chapter 14. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 1. Ready? After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she brake the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than three hundred pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whomsoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of her for a memorial of her. Let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for giving your Word that old men of old moved as they were spake by or moved by the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring your Word and then preserving it for us. We get to old copies of it in our hand today. Lord, we're mindful of many in this world that gather together today and they don't, they don't even have a Bible. They, they come to try to listen and to fellowship and to pray. Lord, how, how valuable and how blessed we are to have the Word of God. Make it precious to us today. I pray, Lord, you're blessed a special, that it will minister to our hearts and you'll prepare us. Our hearts would be fertile soil and good ground that the Word of God could fall into and bring forth fruit. So, Lord, prepare us, please, and bless the special in Jesus' name. Amen. There are things as we travel this earth shifting sands that transcend all the reason of man. But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be held in our hand. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe Whatever the cost And when time has surrendered And earth is no more I'll still cling to the old rugged cross I believe that the Christ who was slain on the cross as the power to change lives to For he changed me completely. A new life is mine. That is why by the cross I will stand. 
I believe that this light with its great mysteries surely someday will come to an end. But faith will conquer the darkness and death and will lead me at last to my friend. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. Father in heaven, now we bow before you as we come to the preaching of the word of God. Lord, I thank you already for the wonderful music this morning and it's ministered to us. And I pray, Lord, as we've sung, that it's come up as a praise and worship to you. And Lord, now as we open up the only book you've ever written, I pray that you would use once again the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Lord, I'm asking you to minister to the hearts of people this morning to move up and down these aisles and in and out of these rows and to stop at every occupied seat. And by thy Holy Spirit, minister to people this morning and meet their needs. If there's any in the room that have never received Christ as their Savior, may that need be met this morning. Those who know Christ as their Savior, may you speak to their heart today. And may we learn from the example of the woman we speak about today. Lord, I will thank you in advance what I believe you'll do in our midst here this morning. For we do pray it in our Savior's name. Amen. A Christian businessman was traveling in Korea. And in the field he saw a a young man pulling a crude plow with an older man behind holding on to the handles. He thought it was interesting and he took their picture. He turned over to the missionary that was his guide and he said, I suppose that they are very poor. And the missionary said, yes they are, but they are both Christians. And when the church they attend was preparing to build a building, they wanted to give, but they did not have any money. So they decided to sell their one and only ox and give the money to the church for the building. And this spring, they're pulling their plow by themselves. The businessman replied, that was a great sacrifice. And the missionary said they didn't call it that. They thought themselves blessed that they had an ox to sell. The text we read today in Mark 14 talks about great sacrifice. Jesus is on His way to Calvary. He'll be there in just a few days. He sits at meat in the house of one Simon the leper. And a woman enters in to show her devotion, and to show her love for Jesus Christ, and she's going to do it with a very costly sacrifice. And her act of love and sacrifice is going to be condemned and criticized by others, but commended by the Lord. In fact, Jesus said of her sacrifice, She hath done what she could. She hath done what she could. 
And he tells us in verse number 9 that what she's done will be remembered forever. And I would say the fact that we're still remembering it 2,000 years later is a testimony to that. And I want to speak to you this morning on that subject, she hath done what she could. And I would submit to you, this woman did what she could in the area of sacrifice. Notice verse number 3, And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there come a woman, having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she brake the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that in indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of ointment made? Sacrifice is to devote with loss for the sake of obtaining something. To devote with loss for the sake of obtaining something. She broke a box of precious ointment and poured it on the feet of Jesus. That perfume or ointment, the Bible tells us, was valued at about 300 pence. A pence was a day's wage. So you figure this ointment that she had was probably about a year's salary. Think about that. The ointment that they're speaking of here would be was, was mainly from a plant in India that people would literally save a lifetime to be able to purchase that they would use for their burial. One of the spices and ointments that they would anoint the body with. And this woman takes it and breaks it and pours it out on the feet of Jesus. Not some of it, but all of it. She gave all she had for God's glory. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever broken your alabaster box for Him? Have you ever offered God your life? To pour your life out for Him? Look at your life since you've received Christ as your Savior. We, have, we do have a nursery if you want to use it. It's downstairs. We do have people there who take good care of it. Listen carefully. Since you've been saved, have you sacrificed anything for Christ? What have you laid on the altar for Him? What have you given to Him? What have you held back for yourself? Are you kind of like the, the when De God told David to uh, go offer a sacrifice and told him where to go, the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite, to stay a plague that was coming. And when he went to Arana's place, Arana knew that God told him to come. And you know what he said? He said, here's the oxen, uh, here's the, the wood, of the, here's everything you need to sacrifice. And David said, no, I'm going to buy it from you. No, you're not going to buy it from me. I'm giving it to you. David said, how can I sacrifice unto the Lord my God that which cost me nothing? It's no sacrifice. And David said, I, I'm not going to sacrifice unto God that which costs me nothing. Then it's no sacrifice. What have you sacrificed for God? Can the Lord look at your life and say, He or she hath done what he or she would he look at you and say he hath done what he could? Would he look at you and say she hath done what she could in the area of sacrifice? I believe also she did what she could in the area of service. Notice verse number 8. Jesus gives her these words, She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. When he said she's done what she could, what he means was she's done everything in her power to do. I'm sure there were things she could not do, but there was something she could do. And what she could do, she did do. Oh, they criticized her. Why was this waste of the ointment made? Now we know from another passage, the one who led that charge was somebody named Judas. 
And he said so because he held the bag and he was a thief. Because he would have liked to have had that money. And so they were indignant. And let me make sure you understand, when you decide that I want to sacrifice for the Lord and, and I'm going to give up something of value for, for someone who I value more, and when you decide I'm going to serve Jesus Christ and I'm going to give Him everything, I'm going to do what I can do, there will always be people to criticize. There will always be people who want to do far less who will tell you, you don't need to do that. You don't need to be in church Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And you don't need uh, to, to read your Bible every day or you don't need to be separate from the world. There will always be somebody who will be indignant at your sacrifice and want to criticize you that that kind of service just isn't necessary but when they talk that way and they get indignant just remind yourself who led that charge when Mary gave it all she had it was the fellow named Judas but she used what she had for the Lord isn't that an interesting thing she used what she had for the Lord Moses what's in your hand a rod throw it on the ground became a serpent that would have been that would have been freaky enough until the Lord says pick it up <laughs> I said buddy you, uh, I would have been close enough to pick it up pick it up but he picked it up and it became a rod again in his hand Moses by the way Use that God used that rod as a miraculous sign to make the people believe. Aaron and Hur held up the hands of Moses when he was weary and they helped the Israelites win the battle. Gideon, God told him, go in, in, in your strength and I'm going to use you to defeat the Midianites. Gideon did what he could. David, you can defeat Goliath with just a sling and a stone in your hand. Oh, they tried to put the armor on him. Remember the armor of Saul? Oh, it's too big and too bulky and too awkward. And David said, I don't need this. Man, I, I just have a stone and a sling. But listen, God has these stones and these slings. And God used him to defeat Goliath. The widow of Zarephath, who God fed out of that little meal of oil and meal in the barrel that she had and fed her for many, many, many months. But that never happened until she gave what she had to Elijah. And then God multiplied it. You see, the little slave girl told her master, her mistress, how, who, who she served, how Naaman could be healed of his leprosy. She did what she could. Those friends who had the paralyzed man and wanted to get him to Jesus. And remember, they came to where Jesus was and there was such a big crowd they couldn't get close. And so they went up the side steps to the roof and they began to tear the roof of the house up. Don't you think they got criticized? Huh? First of all, hey, no cuts. No cutting in line. Hey, hey, the, the line's back here. They just went right by everybody and climbed up on the roof. And you imagine being inside the house as the debris starts begins to fall. Don't you think people have tried to tell them, cut it out? That's not necessary. Oh, yes, it is. We want to get our friend to Jesus. And when they got a hole big enough to let him down through, the Bible says Jesus looked up and he saw their faith. And he healed the man of his disease and, of it, and forgave him of his sins the little boy gave his lunch to Jesus he fed 5,000 men besides women and children why? because the little boy said I'll do what I can I'll do what I can God does amazing things with people who just will do what they could do the widow could give two mites and she was praised by Jesus as the greatest giver there ever was. Peter lent his boat to Jesus to teach out of, and he blessed him with an abundant catch of fish. When Jesus came to the, to the grave of Lazarus, 
What did he ask the people to do? You know what he asked them to do? Roll the stone away. And so they did what they could. And when they rolled the stone away, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> hey, and Lazarus came out of the grave. It's amazing what God will do when we do what we ought to do and what we could do. You see, the people that in a little bit here, Jesus will be ready to make the triumphal trip into Jerusalem and he'll ride on a young colt, a young donkey. You remember the story? He tells his disciples, you go in here and you go to this certain location, you're going to find him tied up right there. And when the owner comes out and asks you, hey, what are you doing? You tell him the Lord has need of him. And that, that's exactly what transpired. The Lord needs him. And they said, okay. Already been worked out. And listen, I don't know what else they had. I don't know what else they could do. But I know they did what they could do. And Jesus rode their donkey into Jerusalem as the crowd shouted, Hosanna. You see, they all saw an opportunity for service. Are you listening? They all saw an opportunity to be used by God, and they took it. And they took advantage of it. They did what they could. You may have another opportunity, but you may not. I don't know about that, but I know we have this opportunity. Hey, uh, we have a... Uh, we may have another cantata after this cantata, but I know this. We have this cantata. We may have another country fair after this country fair. I don't know. We may not. But I know this. We have this country fair. You see, you, you may have another opportunity to, to witness to that neighbor of yours or witness to that friend at work or witness to those folks who God be prompting your heart and your loved ones. You may have another opportunity, but you may not have another opportunity. But I know this. You have this opportunity. You have the opportunity right now. You may have other opportunities to serve in the nursery or to help in a children's church or to clean the building or to sing in the choir. You may not. You may have the opportunity. You may not have another opportunity. But I know this. You have this opportunity. What are you doing with what you have? Are you doing what you could? You know... I think Satan's favorite tool to keep people from getting saved is not to tell them the Bible's not true or the gospel's not true or Christ didn't die for you. I, I think the devil is fine with people believing all that. I think they listen to you and, and they'll say, yes, I know I'm a sinner. I know I, I'm going to die and go to hell. I know Christ died for my sins. I know I need to receive Him as my Savior. Just not now. Not now. I'm not ready. And, and, and that's why the Bible emphasizes. How many times does the Bible emphasize now is the accepted time? Behold, today is the day of salvation. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And we know that now, boy, we, we urge upon people, man, don't put off salvation. I believe hell is full of people who fully intended to be saved. And they died lost. They died without Christ. But listen carefully. We who can press upon others the urgency and the importance of getting saved now. When the Holy Spirit of God comes to us and tells us about an area of service, an area that we ought to be serving God, we say, tomorrow. Tomorrow. We treat, it, we treat it like the, 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 you know, the diet we're going to start tomorrow. Let me finish my chimichanga today. Or the, the exercise. I'm going to get up tomorrow morning and go to the gym. And the next night we go to bed saying, well, for sure tomorrow I'm going to get up and go. And we, we, we put our service for God in the same category. We keep meaning to start. We keep meaning to serve. We keep, we keep uh, intending to do what we should do. 
But on the invitation that Jesus gives to the lost, listen, there's an RSVP on that and it says today. And when the Spirit of God deals with your heart about serving Him, there's no tomorrow with it. The Word is today. When Jesus calls us to follow, He means right now. He means today. Listen carefully. I, I heard this this week. I, in fact, I saw it a quote from another preacher. The quote said this, I do not fear failure. Listen carefully. I do not fear failure. I fear succeeding at something that has no eternal significance whatsoever. I don't fear failure. I fear succeeding at something that has no eternal significance whatsoever. Spend my life to where people look and say, wow, what a success. And yet stand before God and God's God say, what a failure. Because nothing you did was of any eternal significance. My friend, only one life, so soon it will pass. And only what's done for Christ will last. There's no sacrifice too great for me to make for Him. Let me talk about two men. The first man I'll talk about is Howard Hughes. How many are familiar with that name? Howard Hughes. Some of the younger people wouldn't know. Howard Hughes was a multi multi-millionaire. But his last years were spent in isolation, hidden on the top floor of the Xanadu Hotel in the Bahamas. One biographer wrote this about Hugh's appearance before he died. He was emaciated, practically skeletal, and only 120 pounds on his 6 foot 4 inch frame. He was not dead, but it seemed like his body was in decay. Only the long gray hair that trailed halfway down his back and thin scraggly beard that reached midway into his sunken chest and his hideously long nails still showed signs of life. He simply lay in bed, deathly afraid of germs. He spent his days watching movies. He watched his favorite movie, Ice Station Zebra. Never heard of it at least 150 times. Finally emaciated and hooked on morphine and, co and codeine, he died at age 67. He died in 1976 and there was no one to claim his body. Finally a distant cousin came to and was given custody of the body. Time magazine said this, Howard Hughes' death was commemorated in Las Vegas by a minute of silence. Casinos fell silent. Housewives stood uncomfortably clutching their paper cups full of coins at the slot machines. The blackjack games paused in the crap tables. The stickmen cradled the dice in the crook of their wooden wands. Then the pit boss looked at his watch, leaned forward and said, Okay, Roll the dice. He's had his minute. Howard Hughes really lived it up in his life. But he ended up losing his own soul. That's what Jesus meant when he said, what's going to profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? But I want you to compare Howard Hughes to another man by the name of Jim Elliott. On January 8, 1956, he and three other men were attacked and killed by the Aka Indians in the jungles of Ecuador while they were attempting to take the gospel to them. Before he ever went to South America, Jim Elliott wrote this in his diary, God, I pray thee, light these idle sticks of my life that I may burn for thee. Consume my life, my God, it is thine. I seek not a long life, but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. 
And he penned the famous words that he is no fool to give what he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. And all the world would say that Jim Elliot lost his life that day. The truth is he lost his life to Christ before he ever went. He surrendered his life to Christ and he lived the crucified life. The Aka Indians, they couldn't kill Jim Elliot that day because he already died. He had already been dead to self and alive in Jesus Christ. Howard Hughes is a sad story of a man who accumulated great riches but wasted his life. And Jim Elliot is a man who gave his life and surrendered his life to Christ and ended up gaining everything for eternity. That's the life to live. She did what she could in the area of sacrifice. She did what she could in the area of service. She did what she could in the area of surrender. You know, as they sat at the meal, they didn't sit at a table like we sit at a table. They reclined on the floor, oftentimes on an arm or like this, and they ate uh, on the floor in that manner. And by anointing the feet of Jesus, she's bowing down to His feet and with precious ointment, anointing His feet, the Bible says, for the burial. In other words, acknowledging that you're the Christ who has come to die for our sins. She understood the surrender that he was surrendering to die on the cross and by her act of surrender she was surrendering to him all of her Abraham was asked to surrender Isaac and he willingly did so the Bible says you think you know though, though God stopped him in midair and he didn't plunge the knife down into his son the New Testament tells us that he would have believing that God would have raised His Son from the dead. That's faith, my friend. That's surrender. Sometimes God calls us to surrender something and absolutely give something up and we're afraid. What, we start asking the what ifs. But listen, my friend, you leave that in the hand of God. God will take care of the things we surrender to Him. Andrew Murray said this, God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life completely yielded to Him. God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life that is completely yielded to Him. God will take care of you. You know, in the Old Testament, there were, there were four groups of people that got anointed. You know that kings would get anointed. Samuel did it for David. You know that priests were anointed. Moses anointed Aaron. Prophets were anointed. And the dead were anointed. And we understand Jesus was all of those. Is He the King? Yeah, He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Is He the priest? Yes, He's our great high priest, the Bible says. See a prophet? Yes, he's a prophet and yet more than a prophet. And he's dead, but he's not dead today. He's alive because up from the grave he arose. He died on the cross for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. That's why, hey, you have a cross, but if you still got Jesus on the cross, you got the wrong, wrong thing going on there. Jesus is not on the cross anymore. Uh, he went in the tomb. Hey, if you want to wear the symbol, wear, wear an empty tomb. He's not there. He's risen. And He's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. You get to the point of surrender where He is everything. And we are nothing. Giving our lives, as Romans 12 says, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto Him, which is our reasonable service. Let me ask you a question. Can God extract every last drop out of, his, out of your life that He desires? Are you, are you putting all your energies and all your effort into a life 
that has no eternal significance whatsoever. That, that you put all your energy into those things and yet when you stand before God, you'll hang your head in shame. For all the effort and energy put into other things that don't matter in eternity, they're wood, hay, and stubble. And yet they demanded so much of our time, so much of our energies, and we had so little that we're willing to give to God. D.L. Moody was a great evangelist of the 1800s. It is said that D.L. Moody had two million converts. A million in Europe and a million in America. And a man who only lived to be 62 years of age. Greatly used of God and didn't have, didn't have a great education. In fact, it was said that he butchered the king's English. God used D.L. Moody in a great way. And when asked about uh, what do you, how, how can you be, uh, what do you think is the secret to your success, D.L. Moody said, I, I heard one day, he said, I'm only one, but I am one. And I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And what I ought to do, and what I can do, by the grace of God, I will do. And he did. You say, well, I, I can't do everything. No, you can't, but you can do something. And what you can do, and what you ought to do, will you say, by the grace of God, I will do? Make your life count for Christ. What a great, what a great commendation from the Lord. She hath done what? she could she did what she could in the area of sacrifice she did what she could in the area of service and she did what she could in the area of surrender you know God can do some incredible things through surrendered people you can you know you can do people can do incredible things with just a writing instrument any artists in the room? Some of you can take a pen. You can create a beautiful picture. Pencils, different colors. Put a brush with some paints. Wow, beautiful things. But you know, all that can never happen if that instrument is not yielded to the hand that it's in. If you try to paint, you try to draw, you try to write, and that pen fights you at every turn. You're not going to give it get anything done. Are you yielded to God? Are you saying, Lord, I'll be in your hand what you want me, so you'll use me? I'll do what I can. What can you do? You can yield to God. You can, you can sacrifice for Him. You can serve Him. You can surrender to Him. She hath done what she could. How about you? Have you done what you could do? Would that be the Lord's commendation to you this morning? If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, that's what you can do. Because i got good news for you. He's here this morning. And if you'll come to Him, he will in no wise cast you out. He'll receive you as, just as you are and give you the gift of eternal life. Let's bow for prayer. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you, Father, for putting this example of this woman in the Scripture. She hath done what she could. Thank you, Lord. for her example to us. Lord, my heart is burdened this morning. And I don't know, none of us know the day or the hour of your return. We don't know when you'll come back. But I know we're closer than we ever have been. And none of us know how many days we have left. Lord, our 
our dear friend over here, the pastor in Tennessee who was in the car accident. Lord, we're, we're thankful it wasn't worse, but there were worse ones over the last several days where people had no idea it would be their last day on earth. The people who boarded that German Wings airplane this past week had no idea it would be the last flight they'd ever get on. They would go out into eternity. Only one life, so soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. Help us not to succeed at things that will have no eternal significance whatsoever. Help us to do what we can for thee. Help us, please. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to finish the prayer in just a moment. We'll have our invitation this morning. I wonder this morning how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, there's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner and I knew that I needed a Savior and I knew Jesus was the Savior I needed. Pastor, I know for sure that I have eternal life and that I'm on my way to heaven. I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. Here's my hand as a testimony. Will you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. Is there anybody here this morning who would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure if I died that I'd go to heaven. I, I don't know that I've ever really been saved. Would you let me pray for you this morning? won't embarrass you, I won't call you out, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me? Pray for me, Pastor. I think I saw everybody's hand go up a minute ago. Then the question today, Christian, is, have you done what you could? Have you done what you could in the area of sacrifice? Have you done what you could in the area of service? Have you done what you could in the area of surrender? Are you putting all your energies into something that really will have no eternal significance whatsoever? I wonder if the Spirit of God spoke to your heart today. You say, Pastor, I don't want to waste my life on things that will not matter for eternity. God spoke to my heart today. The Spirit of God has pricked my heart. The rest of my days, I, I want to live with the testimony. He hath done what he could. She hath done what she could. Pastor, pray for me this morning. God is dealing with my heart. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. God has spoken to your heart. I don't know if you'll have another invitation to be able to give God everything and to say, Lord, from this point forward, I want to do all I can for Thee. You may have another opportunity, but I know this, you have this opportunity. Don't miss it. Don't postpone it. Don't boast yourself of tomorrow. Do it today. Father in heaven, thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. Thank you, Lord, for hands that have been lifted, indicating you've spoken to their heart. And Father, I pray now that you'll help each one of them to do as you're bidding them to do. That no one would resist thy Holy Spirit this morning. We would come and bow our knee at the altar and say, Lord, I just want to do what I can do. Cannot do everything, but I can do something. Lord, may we pray this morning what I can do and what I ought to do by the grace of God I will do. And in your power and in your strength, help us to do that. May your will be done in every heart and life, Lord. And I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob will sing the invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning. You have longed That's right. for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But 
that you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is her all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always? You must do his sweet will to be free from all ill on the altar your all you must lay is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid your heart does the spirit control you can only be blessed and a peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Thank you for everyone's attention today. Thank you, Spirit of God, for speaking to our hearts this morning. And Lord, I pray that we would leave this place and not be forgetful hearers of the Word of God, but we'd be doers of the Word. And I pray that we would meditate upon the truth of Mark 14 as we go from this place this morning. And every day of our lives, would you remind us, are we doing what we could do for God? For so quickly this life passes. It's but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Thank you for each one that's come this morning. Lord, I pray you'll dismiss us now with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. Lord, help us to please you in all we do and all we say today. Give us a good afternoon and... Prepare our hearts to bring us back for the evening services. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, jointed with Jesus. As we travel this side, for I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.